my name is Jean-Jacques Nantel. Most people believe that technology will save mankind during the coming environmental crisis. It's partly true, as we will see in this video. However, technology will be a very partial solution to our problems for some obvious reasons. First, because the natural environments that make our planet habitable are obviously in a very rapid decline. Second, because it is our ever-growing industrial production and the pollution it generates that are destroying those environments. And third, because all the nations of the world, especially in the South, stubbornly refuse to reduce their standard of living. They don't even want to hear about it. To realize the extent and the severity of our problem, we only have to put some data together. As you can verify with the bibliography I will put at the end of the video, and in the description of the video on the internet, 60% of world's wildlife have been wiped out since 1970, while, according to the World Bank, the size of the Chinese economy alone has been multiplied by 58 between 1989 and 2019. What is worse, the Chinese must triple their per capita consumption if they want to achieve their dream of reaching and eventually surpass the American standard of living. And don't forget that behind the 1.4 billion Chinese consumers, there are 5 billion poor people in the South who are also copying our dirtiest technologies. The will to become rich has gained so much momentum in the South that nobody can stop its economic growth. What will happen if, as it is absolutely certain, mankind keeps going and refuses to make the huge investments that would be necessary to save the planet? It's very simple. All our natural ecosystems will keep collapsing until the moment when the Darwinian natural selection will reappear to kill at random. As usual, only the best adapted, the best prepared, and the luckiest will survive. And it will not be those we would normally expect. In Auschwitz, most survivors were ordinary citizens. Once started, our demographic collapse will continue until the moment when the remaining natural environments will again be able to absorb all the pollution produced by mankind. In the process, many of the major economic and social trends of the modern world will be reversed. For instance, for the first time since the invention of agriculture 12,000 years ago, humans will have to adapt to the fact that their populations will keep decreasing for a very long period of time, maybe during centuries. Such a decline, by the way, is already in the cards since mass urbanization has provoked a worldwide fertility decline, as you can see here. One after the other, all the nations are passing under the replacement level fertility of 2.1 children per woman. That population decline will be sped up by other phenomena. For instance, during an economic depression, people normally decide to wait before having more children. We must also take into account the over-mortality caused by the three inseparable calamities we call war, famine, and epidemic. Since armies always prefer to fight on a flat and treeless terrain, they tend to wage their wars on farmlands which forces farmers to flee and disturbs the food production in large areas. That, in turn, creates famines that weaken the, Im the immune systems of the local population and allow deadly epidemi epidemics to kill a large percentage of it. <coughs> it's noteworthy that the most deadly wars, especially when they oppose two coalitions 
of equal importance are not produced by dictators like Napoleon or Hitler, but by some major crisis nobody wanted in the first place. That's what Gaston Bouteau explained in his book entitled The War Phenomenon. It's striking that wars often stop without producing any clear winner, normally because both sides are exhausted and no longer have enough unemployed young men to sacrifice. It's not only by killing young people and provoking famines that future wars will reduce our global population, but also by poisoning with radiations and toxic chemicals the fertile land that normally after a conflict is used to feed the survivors. The poisoning I'm, I'm talking about, anyway, will only add its effect to the other massive pollution produced by the pesticides and the fertilizers used by our modern farmers. Since most of our future crops will be exposed to heavily polluted rain, it is probable that the farmers living in the most isolated food producing regions of the world will try to reduce the deterioration of their farmland by eliminating most of the chemicals they presently spread on their crops. As a result, the quantity of food available in the world market will collapse, which will increase the number of famines, especially in overpopulated countries. The impoverishment of an ever-decreasing world population will greatly reduce the demand for goods and services produced in faraway countries, which means that the globalization of the world economy will reverse its course. Since a large proportion of our present economic exchanges are made on flat and low-lying on the flat and low-lying surface of the oceans, the world population will also reverse its age-old movement from the interior of the continents towards their coasts. If our prehistoric hunter-gatherer ancestors lived all over the five continents, it was because they had to follow their prey. The situation changed some 12,000 years ago when some of their descendants invented agriculture because the first farmer had, farmers had to settle in low-lying plains where there was water. With the population explosion that followed, people started to move towards the bottom of valleys where they built villages near small rivers and later small farming towns near much larger rivers like the Nile in Egypt. Finally, with the Industrial Revolution, the world population grew so fast that a large percentage of it migrated towards megacities located near the oceans. At the beginning of the 21st century, many of our megacities have 20 million inhabitants or more. In the future, when everybody will stop using the natural environments as open-air dumps, humans will slowly disperse all over the continents to avoid concentrating too much pollution on very tiny surfaces. Nowadays, that movement away from the cities has already begun in a declining country like the United States, for instance, in Detroit, a city that lost more, more than half its population and most of its industries since the 1950s. Many other U.S. cities are experiencing the same kind of exodus. In the future, that movement towards the interior of the continents we should accelerate due to the fact that our modern megacities are perfect targets for epidemics and famines as well as for nuclear and terrorist attacks. It's inevitable, someday, Somewhere, some imbecile will detonate over megacities some of the nuclear toys we manufactured precisely for that purpose. Even if our descendants will have lost control over their destiny, 
those who will live far from the most dangerous regions of the world should be able to pass through the coming ecological disaster by reducing their standard of living and by investing in the technologies that will allow them to wait until the end of the environmental crisis. First, they will have to get rid of all the destructive knowledge accumulated by our, our consumer societies. I'm talking about things like the fashion industry or the recipes to create zero calorie foods that allow people to eat as much as they can without getting fatter. Second, they will develop cultures that will do the exact opposite by dematerializing all their activities. In other words, they will systematically try to concentrate as much energy as possible in the smallest quantity of matter. In a universe where energy is rare and has a natural tendency to scatter, dematerialization is as old as the life itself. Our own body, and especially our brain, which have been uh, created by uh, 4 billion years of evolution, are perfect examples of it since our tiny little brain is still more creative and versatile than all the computers of the world put together. Since the Stone Age, all the cultural evolution of mankind has been achieved by dematerializing our technologies. Little by little, our tools have become lighter and more efficient. The same thing happened with the different forms of energy we used. After burning wood, which is a very complex raw material, we used coal that produced a lot of soot and, soon after, petroleum that didn't produce any. Since the Second World War, we learned to produce atomic energy by using uranium and plutonium, two of the heaviest elements in nature, before finally creating nuclear fusion by transforming hydrogen into helium, which are the two lightest elements in our universe. Even if the entrepreneurs of the Industrial Revolution had nothing but content for our natural environments, they nevertheless did everything they could to increase the efficiency of their factories and of their employees. The development of electronics after the Second World War sped up that process by replacing with machines millions of manual workers whose sons and daughters became well-educated and well-paid white-collar workers. Finally, since the 1990s, the development of ever more powerful microcomputers led to the creation of the Internet and of an economy based on knowledge and information. Two products, totally immaterial, that can be moved very fast, very far, and in enormous quantities at a very low cost. The growth of that very profitable industry should continue for a while since there is an empirical law called the Moore's Law which predicts that computers will keep doubling their power every two years. That empirical law has remained valid since the 1960s. Since the most industrialized countries were the first to use computers on a very large scale, their old the dirty industries based on concrete, metal, and petroleum showed a strong tendency to migrate towards overpopulated countries like China, where people are less educated and less demanding. By accepting on its soil our dirtiest industries, China certainly became the factory of the world, but it also became a gigantic dump. In a century, where the environment will become by far the costliest economic factor, the Chinese could soon regret their recent mass industrialization. In the Western world, the heavy industry that stayed behind sometimes tried to make money by creating even more pollution than before. It was the case with the North American oil companies 
which invested heavily in the tar sands and shale oil extraction. Those investments have proved to be so unprofitable and unpopular that after dominating Wall Street for decades, the oil companies have been replaced by the GAFAM, those internet giants whose main activities are based on knowledge and information. The same stock exchange decline is also obvious in the automobile sector, where giant companies like GM, Ford or Toyota invested so much money in factories which make traditional cars that they lack the capital, the profits and the expertise they would need to compete with Tesla, a company which produces electric cars that are less fragile and much easier to manufacture since they are made with much fewer parts. The main reason why electric cars never became mainstream before is because their electric batteries didn't contain enough energy by kilogram of matter. It was a classical dematerialization problem that an engineer like Elon Musk has solved by studying the laws of physics in order to find what was technically feasible. That being done, Musk used the KISS principle to make sure that from the start all his factories and all his products remained as simple and as dematerialized as possible. By using that very simple method, Musk, who thinks out of the box, has been able to disturb many industries. Because of him, the car production, the energy storage industry, the oil and gas market, the rocket industry, the banking sector, he invented PayPal, the high-speed internet, etc. have been changed forever. In the future, our descendants, who will be much fewer and poorer than us, will be forced to use that method in order to survive. Since our natural environments will take centuries to recover and to clean our mess, they will, they will have to use the few remaining resources at their disposal uh, to develop the most promising technologies of the modern world. To obtain clean and renewable energy, they will probably use improved solar panels which have the enormous advantage of, of being passive and to be easily installed near their users. To get clean water, which is by far the most important raw material used by mankind, they could produce it by filtering polluted waters with graphene membranes. Graphene is a material made of a very thin layer of carbon atoms that can be used to eliminate the largest molecules floating in a, in a liquid. Since the rain will be heavily polluted, our descendants will be forced to produce almost all their food in greenhouses like the ones used nowadays on a very small scale in a northern and cold country like Iceland. For the other raw materials, they will probably get them by mining the gigantic garbage deposits we will have left behind. For them, recycling will no longer be a fashionable trend, but an essential part of their way of life. To achieve that result, they could simply add a depollution tax in the price of every man-made product and use the money it would produce to buy back all the objects that would otherwise end up in dumps. Because plastics are very useful, light and extremely easy to mold, our descendants will certainly continue to produce them by using petroleum, but unlike us, they will recycle them. Since we are talking about recycling, I must say something about the 3D printers that are about to create a new industrial revolution by allowing each family to produce for free and at home an enormous quantity of industrial products by using the plastic and the metal we already find in large quantity in the garage and the attics of the world. 
We can already find on the internet the 3D plans that allow people to print complicated industrial products like weapons, cars and even houses. Some inventors even try to photocopy the 3D printers themselves. If they have enough resources, the small nations scattered all over the world, uh, when the situation will finally stabilize, should collaborate to uh, maintain or to rebuild an efficient and a very economical communication system like the Internet. Since most of the minds of the world will then be depleted, they could do the same thing to finance the production of the recyclable rockets we already invented in order to get from space the rarest and most indispensable raw materials. That should be relatively easy to do since we recently discovered that many metal-rich asteroids called geocruisers often pass near our planet. We also know that between Mars and Jupiter, there are billions of metal-rich asteroids which float freely in a zero-gravity environment. If I tell you all that, it is to show that during the coming environmental collapse, the pollution created by uh, our wars, our industries and by multiple uh, natural catastrophes will be so severe and ubiquitous that only the most technological societies will have a reasonable chance to survive. This being said, those societies who will be uh, very poor and small will uh, not even try to, uh, to realize the costliest dream of those who want to uh, uh, develop an artificial intelligence. Why will they abandon that quest? Because it will be with humans who think, who easily repair themselves and who reproduce with ease and with an intense pleasure that mankind will build its future and reach for the stars. It will not be with fragile and complex robots which never invented anything new, which followed blindly the programs we write for them and that don't even know they exist. Politically also, the world of tomorrow will be pretty different. In a world where most people will be too poor to pay taxes, central governments will inevitably be less important and powerful than today. Throughout history, governments have been nothing more than parasites who paid for the roads, the bridges and the administrators an economy needs to function with the taxes levied on the real producers of wealth, namely the individuals, the families and the, the, the small communities scattered on a given territory. It is so true that before the Industrial Revolution, most countries were ruled by far away monarchs or dictators, while the most important economic decisions were taken locally in a democratic manner during village gatherings where elders took the final decisions by after considering the interests of all the locals. The central government had nothing to say in it. Long ago, the Chinese peasants used to say, the emperor is very far and the mountains very high. Since the problem of our descendants will be to produce as much wealth as possible without producing a lot of pollution, they will do the exact opposite of what the modern Western globalists try to do. Rather than destroying nations, they will do everything in their power to preserve those very efficient products of history and geography. Because nations are well adapted to their environments and uh, are more homogeneous than multicultural societies, they can more easily produce consensus and wealth. They are the future. I thank you in advance to share this video on the internet, to give it uh, the thumbs up, uh, the, to sh subscribe to my channel and to help me financially. It will be much appreciated. See you next time.